the president of the David Lynch Foundation. Most of you heard this, but some of you came in late, so I'd like to quickly reintroduce him. He is Dr. John Hagelin, a world-renowned quantum physicist, educator, author, and science and public policy expert. Dr. Hagelin has conducted pioneering research at the European Center for Particle Physics and the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center and is responsible for the development of a highly successful grand unified field theory based on the superstring. His scientific contributions in the fields of electroweak unification, grand unification, supersymmetry and cosmology include some of the most cited references in the physical sciences. Dr. Hagelin received his doctorate from Harvard University. He is currently director of the Institute of Science, Technology, and Public Policy and professor of physics at Maharshi University of Management. And he is establishing a much needed University of World Peace in Washington, DC. Would you please welcome Dr. John Hagelin. Thank you very much. I normally am not afraid of public speaking, but following David Lynch is a different experience. He's got this million dollar coiffure, <laughs> which makes some of us feel a little follically challenged. <clears throat> and what's underneath the coiffure is so incredible, such an artist, and so articulate in describing in such a poetic but lucid way these deep experiences of inner consciousness it's not really much for me to say, except perhaps to shed some scientific light on what this experience is, which I'll try to do. Really, the experience of unity beneath life's surface diversity is an age-old experience, an understanding of every major tradition of knowledge on Earth, every major spiritual tradition on Earth. And in the last 25 years, particularly in the last 10, Modern science, through its own systematic means of gaining knowledge, has probed deep into the structure of physical reality and also confirmed a fundamental unity at the basis of life's surface diversity. The conclusion of all this centuries of research simply is the universe is superficially complex but fundamentally simple. The universe is superficially diverse, but fundamentally unified. And the understanding is that if we scratch deeply enough beneath the surface, beneath the cellular, molecular, atomic, nuclear, subnuclear, quarks and leptons, electroweak unified, grand unified, and super unified scale, millions upon millions of times more fundamental than the atomic nucleus, we ultimately do arrive at a field of indivisible wholeness or unity, a unified fountainhead of all the diverse laws of nature that uphold the universe at every level, all the particles that fill the universe and comprise our bodies, all the forces that make the particles move, all the particles and forces the entire universe is understood today as various vibrational modes, vibrational states of a universal field of existence, field of unity, <clears throat> field of infinite energy density, infinite dynamism. This universal source of the laws of nature, the source of all order displayed throughout the universe, is the origin of universes and percolates universes like ginger ale percolates effervescent bubbles. Most of these universes are duds, but some of them undergo exponential inflation and expansion and are populated by galaxies and stars and presumably people. <clears throat> we are the occupants of one such universe. So it is a huge reality, this ocean of existence, the field of unity at the basis of life's diversity. Now, the comprehension of this unity, it turns out, is not the sole province of theoretical physicists with their impressive empirical and theoretical means, mathematical means, but it is an age-old experience of life and a prized experience in every major tradition on Earth. Today, this experience of pure consciousness or unbounded awareness at the source of thought has become a major study 
of modern scientific research in the fields of physiology and psychology. This experience of unity within turns out to be a fourth major state of consciousness, distinct from waking, dreaming, or sleeping. It has its own subjective reality, we've heard about that, and its own objective reality. For one thing, the body gains a state of rest several times deeper than sleep. The breath is barely moving because the mind is completely still. But the brain itself is transformed markedly, particularly in the direction of what's called global EEG coherence. We're gonna see an incredible demonstration of this live a very brave student is going to come up and meditate for us for a couple of minutes, wired to a brain encephalogram, and we're going to see underneath the hood and find out what's going on inside the meditating brain. It's fascinating. <clears throat> but the hallmark of that brain transformation is one of coherence. Now, you know how the brain encephalogram works? Different leads measuring electrical activity at different points on the scalp, the frontal and occipital lobes, the left and right hemispheres. I don't know if any of you have ever seen your own brain encephalogram, your own EEG. It's depressing. <laughs> All the different areas of the mind and personality seem to be completely uncoordinated. It's very much mathematically like an orchestra. Prior to the emergence of the conductor and all the musicians are warming up their instruments, sawing back and forth, creating a discordant cacophony of sound. That's what the brain looks like, as you'll see in a moment. Suddenly the conductor comes, raises the baton, and this cacophony turns into flowing music. It is an extremely striking feature, signature, of the meditating mind. The so-called meditating state, or spiritual experience, or holistic experience, or atma chetana, self-consciousness, or whatever it may be called in different traditions. Now, as an educator, let me just quickly say that this already constitutes an educational discovery of the foremost magnitude. And the reason it is is because orderly brain functioning correlates with rising IQ, intelligence, increased creativity, improved memory and learning ability, academic performance, moral reasoning, psychological stability, emotional maturity, alertness, reaction time. Everything good about the brain depends on its orderly functioning. And now, orderliness of brain functioning can be systematically developed in students of any age just by exposing human awareness to the source of thought, this state of unbounded awareness within. And that's a complete transformation of what has been the common understanding of human potential, which has been bleak. The story has been that at age 16 or 17, we've peaked. From there on, intelligence begins a slow and steady decline. Gray matter starts to shrink quickly. Now, when you get to be my age, we explain, we say that, well, we make up for that through our experience and our wisdom and maturity. It's still a bleak view of human potential and wrong. The human brain, as we'll see in a moment, is so plastic, so malleable, continuously forging new connections. It has the capability of developing in intelligence and creativity and self-esteem and inner strength and bliss throughout life. So it's really remarkable what happens when you take something like meditation and put it into education and watch the students of any age grow in intelligence, brightness, alertness, performance, happiness. For this reason alone, I think this is the missing element in education. But I want to put this experience in a different context. This field of pure consciousness is not foreign from any of us. We may not experience it directly, but it is our own subjectivity. It is our consciousness, left alone finally for a moment to experience its own nature. And what I mean by that is the problem with waking consciousness, where we live our lives, is that the structure of waking experience is always a process of awareness of something, some little thing, in contrast to the nature of the knower, which is cosmic, universal, unbounded, creativity, bliss. But the consciousness is forsaken, in a sense, sacrificed 
for the objects of experience. And the moment you get up in the morning, you hear the alarm, you realize you're late for school, late for class, it's one experience after another at the expense of the experiencer. So although this experience of consciousness is intimately familiar on one sense, it's really never or rarely experienced on another sense. And that consciousness is the one thing in our life that never changes. It's the one thing that's been there since infancy that has never changed and allows us to believe correctly that we're the same person today, ultimately, than we were, even though our bodies have changed for the worse. Our friends have changed, our environments have changed, our beliefs have changed, our professions have changed, our spouses have changed, or whatever, everything changes but that. And that, unfortunately, is the most fundamental of experiences and tragically missed. That's what meditation is for. That's why it has been treasured throughout the ages. Even though today in the world, I think meditation is misunderstood a lot and many of the techniques just aren't that effective in actually reaching that goal. So the experience of the self is sometimes called self-realization, liberation, enlightenment, because it is so huge and fundamentally contented that it's a sacrifice to lose it for the sake of spinach or okra or mashed potatoes or whatever it is we're eating at the moment that really becomes our experience of life. Get it back. Now, the problem and the solution are pretty simple. Education focuses human comprehension very sharply, very skillfully. We become very proficient at doing whatever it is we specialize in doing. By the time you become a master's student, you realize you're starting to learn more and more about less and less. At the doctoral level, you've become the world's greatest expert in nothing. My doctoral thesis was called Weak Mass Mixing, CP Violation, and the Decay of B-Quark Maisons. How many have read it? <laughs> Almost everybody. It's, it's a wonderful thing. It's the specialization is not the evil. It's the lack of a few moments and a little bit of training to allow the attention to withdraw from those narrow confines of perception to begin to reacquaint itself with its own nature, to expand and expand until comprehension becomes suddenly unbounded. And then you become familiar with the eternity, the non-changing invincible core of yourself, which brings great strength, great creativity, as David said really more eloquently than anyone. <laughs>